Thank you everyone for coming here. Um, to start off, I really just, I, I want to thank John. I started contributing to open source software um, really over the summer and uh, did a Zio test was just uh, starting and it's been an incredible opportunity to uh, work with John. He's been a real mentor to me and uh, while it's come a long way since then, you can see how some of those ideas uh, that he had at the very beginning are still uh, driving what we're doing today. Um, so I'm really going to try to talk about three things today. Um, first, what does it mean for effects to be second class citizens in testing frameworks today? What are the implications of that? Um, second, what would it mean for tests to be first class values? And then third, we'll explore Zeo Test, which is a library that tries to take that idea to its logical conclusion to solve a lot of the problems that we deal with every day when we're writing tests. So first of all, why should we care? Why do we need another <coughs> testing framework? We've got Specs2, we've got ScalaTest, we've got ScalaCheck. We probably don't like writing tests to begin with. Why do we need something new here? Uh, and the way I like to think about it is your test framework should go where you go and help you solve the problems that you deal with when you're writing tests. So let me ask you all a, a few questions here. How many of you write code that is async or concurrent? Yeah, pretty much everyone. How many of you write code that either intentionally or unintentionally doesn't always behave the same way on every run? Guilty, yeah. How many of you write code that involves some kind of uh, service you use that may have different implementations, different live versus test implementations? Uh, people. Related to that, do you ever write tests that require some type of fixture that requires setting up or tearing down? Yeah. And do you ever write code that maybe has different implementations for different platforms, Scala.js versus JVM, or different versions, you have to do something a little bit different, or 2.11 if you still support it, or Dottie if you try to support that. All right, so those are some of the things. Let's kind of go through what we can do with existing testing frameworks and how well that works or doesn't work for us. And as we go through that, I want us to think for all of these about the idea that with these existing testing frameworks, they essentially don't know about whatever effect systems we have. Scala test doesn't have any idea what a cat's IO is or what Zio is or any of this. So the only thing that our testing frameworks see is a future. And if we've kind of been around functional programming enough, we know there are a bunch of issues with future that it's an in-flight computation. It's not a description of a computation. So we can't compose it together by doing it multiple times, for example. It's not interruptible. It doesn't have a concept like bracket that exists or like managed or resource for safe resource management. So essentially we have all these things, but then we kind of throw them away when we go to a future. And we'll see how that plays out in some of these examples. So first thing we asked, asked you about was concurrency and async. So let's look at this code. So this is just an effect that is going to print still going forever. Maybe probably intentionally not going to write this, but definitely written code doesn't terminate. But we're using Scala test. It should be OK. There's default timeout of 150 milliseconds on everything. So this test is going to time out and fail, right? Well, what's going to happen here? Yeah, the test is going to fail, but this testing framework has no way of actually interrupting that effect. So you're going to just going to see print line forever and ever and ever. Or worst case, maybe the effect is going to be in a loop, but actually isn't going to be printing everything. So you're just going to notice, hey, why did my computer suddenly get really slow? Until you have to just shut down the whole thing and reopen it. Specs 2 exactly the same way. We can add a timeout, but a timeout is failing the test. It doesn't have any way to actually interrupt the effect. Uh, the next problem we talked about is indeterminism, code that doesn't behave the same way every time. So uh, testing frameworks today have, typically have good tools for retrying a failed test. 
Um, that seems to be kind of a pretty common behavior that uh, they support. But there is not an easy way to run the same test multiple times and require that it say succeeds 100 times or succeeds 200 times. And that's actually, especially for like concurrent code where maybe every once in a while you're gonna have a race condition, that's a really nice thing to be able to do. And maybe we can work around it by just in our own effect, we can say we're gonna repeat this thing 100 times and then we're going to say we're gonna require all those to be the same value and say that's gotta be the return value. But that's kind of us doing the work instead of the testing framework doing the work for us. Uh, we talked about dependencies and services that we might be using. So here's a really simple test of a console program. All it does is says hello, but as written, completely untestable. Because all it's gonna do is display something to the console that our testing framework doesn't have any way of accessing. Now, if we've kind of read about this, we might know, well, there's some things we can do. We could do tagless final. We could try to pass some type of implicit or function around that it describes how to print and give a different implementation that maybe prints to a buffer. But all those things, we've got to completely rewrite our program. And whatever way we come up with, we've essentially got to write our own version of that buffer that we're going to write to. Our testing framework is kind of saying, look, I'm not going to stop you if you want to do that but it's not really doing anything to help us there. Related to that, we could talk about resource usage. So here we've got an example of, let's say we are testing something with Kafka. So we need some type of Kafka service that we're setting up and it takes a while to set it up. So we only want to do it once at the beginning of our tests and once at the end of our tests. Well, you would think one of the things we have is this concept of a managed or a resource, something that needs to be opened and closed, and you would think that should fit in really well with our testing framework. But our testing framework isn't really built for that because it's expecting an actual value to supply to each of the tests. If we want to actually supply one copy to everyone instead of supplying separate copies of this, to each of our tests and essentially opening and closing the service twice and taking all that time. So it's actually really tricky to kind of use a managed resource here. We have to open the scope and then we have to keep it open long enough so we don't end up closing it too early. We kind of, it'd be a lot easier to write this if we didn't use the manage at all, if we just opened it and closed it as kind of an impure effect. But then we kind of lose all that safety that a managed or resource is supposed to give us and the ability to compose those together. If let's say that Kafka service depends on something else, which depends on three other things, if those are all resources, we can just compose those together naturally. If these are all individual actions we need to take, we need to kind of be a lot more careful and we need to do that work again that hopefully we kind of figured out how to write a managed or resource once and that kind of took care of it for us. Finally, we talked about multiple versions of platforms. So let's say that we're testing some uh, system property that's going to be different on the JVM versus JavaScript. Or let's say that this was a weird bug that came up for us when we were doing some of our own testing in Zio, where uh, double dot not a number behaved slightly differently on Scala 2 versus Dottie. That actually got fixed last night in the nightly version that came out. But what are you going to do there? Are you going to have separate files for each of these tests? Well, that's kind of a lot of work and a lot of work to maintain. At least for mine, it's hard enough to kind of keep good test coverage on everything and keep that updated without now having multiple version and platform specific files floating around. So actually got a bunch of problems that it seems like we could kind of do better on where we've learned to get by ourselves, but we haven't really been getting the support we should from our test framework for these domains. So how do we start to solve this problem, especially since we don't have that much time here to solve it? Well, the, the first step is realizing that we've actually solved most of these problems before in just all the work that the functional programming community has done over the last four or five years in developing these functional effect systems of we've got whether it's CATS or Zio or whatever, we've got a ton of these systems that describe effects rather than actually running them. We've got built-in interruptibility. We've got built-in resource safety. We've got typically, we may have some type of environment type, maybe with more or less boilerplate or need to put in a Plicely or something like that. 
but we have some way to express dependencies there. So we've kind of solved these problems. We're just losing those solutions right now when we go to our testing frameworks. So to try to get past this, we could start to think about just a test as a value. So think about just a test as a IO, an effect, that can either fail with some test failure E or succeed with some test success S. And immediately there, we recover the ability to solve a lot of these problems very naturally and organically. So you think about how to time out a test. Well, you know, whether it's CATS IO or whether it's ZO, timeout is a pretty basic operation that's built in for these tests that plugs directly into the interruption capability of those effect systems. Let's say that we want to check that a test isn't flaky. Well, in the ZEO world, we could just do schedule recurrence and just repeat it 100 times. With CATS, I think we need a little bit more work to kind of do the recursion ourselves, but the same thing, because we just have this description. We can run it 100 times. If we want to provide a managed resource to a test, well, now that's exactly what the managed resource was designed for. We just use the resource, where here test with resource would be a function that takes that resource and returns a test. So all of these problems get very natural solutions once we start to think about tests as effects. Um, so Zeo test is really a library that tries to take this idea to its logical conclusion, where everything is a value. So to start off, the core data type of Zeo test is a Z test. We kind of knew we had to do it coming from Zeo, right? We've got to put a Z in front of everything, and we've got to give you an R parameter. So a Z test is an effectual test that requires some environment R and can either succeed with an S or fail with an E. And then we can think of a spec as just a collection of tests. It's just a, essentially a recursive data structure where every spec is either just one individual test or a suite that itself can have multiple specs inside it that each could be tests or subsuites. And you can go down as far as you want. And that's just a value that we can manipulate. We can filter. We can do all the things we're used to doing with essentially just a collection of tests, a hierarchical collection of tests. And the final thing we're able to build on this is this thing called a test aspect. And you can think of a test aspect as a polymorphic function from one test to another test. The possibility of expanding any of those type parameters. And we'll see in a sec how these can be incredibly powerful and composable for doing a lot of these things we want to do with tests. And the other great thing about this is, despite the somewhat fearsome type signature, uh, this infer infers almost perfectly, where I don't know in any case where you've had to specify the type parameters for this because of the covariance and contravariance there. Um, so let's see a little bit of how we can use some of these tools to turn those problems we were dealing with before into essentially one-liners. So concurrency, we talked about how do we time out a test and actually stop the thing we want to stop. Well, we just do at at is our nice little syntax for applying test aspects. So all we do is we apply test aspect timeout one second. And this is going to tie into Zio's entire interruption mechanism. So when you run this, you're going to see print line a ton of times. And then after a second, you're going to see it stop. The test is going to fail. You're going to go on with the rest of your tests. Really easy. So then we talked about how do we make sure that a test is consistently passing if maybe we're dealing with some type of concurrency issue or race condition. Well, there's a test aspect for that. Non-flaky, we'll just run a test, specified number of times, by default 100, but put in whatever number you want there, and it'll be successful if all those times pass. Otherwise, it'll fail the test. How about dependencies on other services? So this is where that R type in Zio really shines for us. Because if we wrote this program with Zio using the environment, we would have, from the beginning, used console put stirline, which would normally put something to the console. But 
is just a service in the environment. So we can replace it with a test implementation and ZeoTest has out of the box test implementations for all the standard environment types. Things like console, clock, random, system. So all these things become super testable where I do my same effect and then all I do is I call this test console object and I get the output. And then I can just make an assertion on what that output is. I don't have to rewrite any of that stuff myself. It's already there for me. How about resource usage? Well, we can model that same Kafka service we talked about before as a dependency in the environment. And then we can just provide that dependency. And what we've got is for every uh, provide method, we've got a provide variant and we've got what we call a provide shared variant that will provide one copy of that resource to the entire group of tests. So again, incredibly flexible. If we want to provide the whole thing, provide managed shared, we want to provide to each, provide managed. If one of those was a subsuite, we could just provide the resource to that subsuite. We got total flexibility there. And that Kafka service we're providing is just a managed that we can compose in all the ways that we know how to compose managed resources. So again, really easy to more lines of code to write the dummy tests to show the example that it did to actually solve the problem of providing the resource. Finally, we talked about multiple versions and platforms. So I feel like I sound like Oprah here, there's a test aspect for that. Uh, so we've got this test aspect, JVM only, that will treat the test as ignored if it's not on the JVM and will run the test on the JVM. And we've got a bunch of varieties of running on a platform, run on everything except the platform. Um, so again, make it very easy for you to solve that problem. And the other great thing about all these is they're really composable. So all those test aspects, you can just chain one after the other. You can even have test aspects that modify other test aspects. So let's say we've got this challenge of we need to run a test and we want to make sure that it's not flaky but this test is a lot slower on JavaScript than JVM. So we're going to make sure it's not flaky on JVM, we're just going to make sure we want to run it once on JavaScript. But no matter what, we don't want to spend more than 60 seconds on this test. Well, actually super easy, right? Test, JVM is going to make sure that test aspect only gets applied in JVM, non-flaky. So we're going to run it 100 times on the JVM, and then the whole thing, we're going to time out for 60 seconds. Super easy. So what else do we get with this? We solved the basic problem. What else can we get out of having this? Well, one of the things we can get out of the box is property-based testing. Where most other testing frameworks, property-based testing is this other thing, right? You've got your Scala test or whatever, and then you bring in your Scala check dependency. And hopefully you've got good integration for those two, and there's a package that kind of helps you out with that. Because Property based testing is kind of this other thing, and you've got state you've got to manage, you've got random state you've got to thread through, how do we deal with all that? But the great thing about building this on top of Zeo is we've got all those capabilities out of the box. We've got ref to manage state. We've got our implementations of the random services. So we can do that ourselves, and we can even leverage some of the other <coughs> Zeo data types, particularly Zstream, which Itamar is going to be talking more about tomorrow. So we can think about a generator as actually being an effectual stream of values that potentially requires some environment. And so if we can have an effectual stream, it's very easy for us to generate normal random values, but it also gives a ton of flexibility to execute other effects that we couldn't safely do within a framework like ScalaCheck where it's just state that it controls. So, for example, maybe we want to load the data we're going to use from some kind of file, right? We've got some kind of database or CSV file or something that has all of our test cases. Well, that's going to be an effect. Bring that in and maybe there's going to be a manager resource there that's going to have to be, we're going to have to close some socket or something. We can do all of that within the context of Zstream in addition to just generating random data. In addition to that, we get to unify random generation and deterministic generation. So you can think of a random generator as a string that has just one value, which is an effect, that generates a random value. And you just keep generating that one effect. Versus if you have a deterministic <coughs> generator, 
of like one, two, three, four, five, that's just a string with five elements. And those two compose together in just the right ways, where if you compose two random generators, you get a random generator that just pulls from each. If you generate a deterministic and a random, you would generate all your deterministic generators, and each time you would pull a random value. So it gives you a lot of power there. And the other thing you can see there is it's not just a Z stream of values, but of these things called samples. And each sample is essentially a value along with a tree of potential shrunk versions of that value. And so this is what, what we call integrated shrinking. And it's, it's a big difference between our approach and what Scalacheck does. Because what Scalacheck does is um, shrinking is separate from data generation. So you're either relying on these kind of implicit arbitrary instances that have their own logic for shrinking, or you have to write your own shrinker, which as far as I can tell, no one ever does. But the problem with that is that your shrunk value won't necessarily obey the invariance of the data that you're generating. So let's see an example of that. So this is a pretty simple property that just says for all for positive integers, so greater than zero, the product of two integers is greater than their sum. Turns out that's not true, right? If one of them is one, then x plus one is greater than x times one. But let's test it and see what happens. So Scalacheck is gonna say it failed with counterexample list zero one. So okay, it failed, that's good. But hold on a sec, I said all my values were supposed to be between one and 10. So you didn't, your minimized example isn't actually a counterexample to this case. And that's because generation is separate from shrinking. And Scalacheck kind of tries to put some band-aids on that, but fundamentally, it's pretty easy for them to fall off in cases like this. <coughs> Versus with Zio test, if we do the same thing, fail with counterexample 1-1, one, one, which is the smallest <coughs> possible failing example. So we talked about property-based testing. Let's just briefly hit on assertions. So assertions are uh, Zio tests answer to essentially matches. Uh, so an assertion takes in some type of value and gives you an assertion result, which you can kind of think of as a true or false with some extra information attached to it. And the great thing about assertions is that assertions compose. So if I have something like here, I've got write sum three, I can say is write, is sum, is greater than four, and you can think of each of those assertions is essentially almost like an optic, if you, if you are familiar with that terminology, that zeroes in on part of a structure and each time gets more specific about what you're asserting about it. And so all of these, there's no implicit syntax here, nothing like this, there's just one assertion object that has lots and lots of these that you can look up. They all plug right together like that. And the great thing is they give you super detailed error reporting if something goes wrong where you essentially get, you can almost think of it as a stack trace of each part of that assertion and where it fit in the overall assertion. Because you might have, I mean, these are kind of just examples that are easy to show on a screen, but you might be doing some assertion about some giant case class, and if I just tell you, well, this giant case class didn't equal this giant case class, okay, what are you gonna do with that without kind of getting out your magnifying glasses? But if we do this, then it's really easy for you to know what went wrong. Um, so this is kind of a brief overview of the features in Zio Test. There's a ton more. There's a great mocking framework that uh, Peter worked on. I think a couple people are going to be talking about that later. Um, a lot of other good features here. So I would just really encourage you, um, one, check it out. Uh, come to our GitHub or Discord. Um, if there are things that you want, you're not seeing, please ask. I'm always trying to add new features to make it easier for people to test. Um, you should try Zio, but even if you don't use Zio, uh, there's an interop package that makes it available for users of Cat's Effect. So whatever uh, functional effect system you use, come check it out. Um, and then I would say, even if you don't end up using Zio tests, just demand more from your testing framework. I think we've kind of gotten used to not getting everything we need as kind of our effect systems and we've evolved in other ways, but our testing frameworks haven't evolved to the same extent just because I think it's hard to evolve when you've got a lot of people using it and you don't want to break things for them. But if you're looking for where you write tests today, I think there's a lot of more functionality that we can all be getting, whether it's from this library or from somewhere else. Um, so thank you all for your time. Uh, thanks again to John. Thank you to all the uh, 
Zio contributors and to everyone who's used or, uh, or commented on uh, Zio test.